Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the morning recording. I'm just hanging out. It's a little after 10 o'clock uh, on this beautiful day. It's Thursday. The week's almost over. Hope all you fuckers still have your jobs and didn't tell your bosses to fuck off in a way that, that I would have <laughs> already this week. Um, not saying that if they're taking advantage of you, you shouldn't do that, but just hopefully you guys out there keep your lives consistent and uh, not wrecking shit everywhere you turn. Um, myself, personally, uh, I just already got a call uh, from the place where I had that job interview a couple days ago. I didn't really talk about it yesterday. I uh, kind of just slipped my mind. We were talking about lots of other things, but uh, the job interview went well. Uh, he told me most likely I had it right there on the spot. Um, said he doesn't like to always tell people that because, uh, you know, people like to take advantage of the situation and think maybe get a little bit more of a of a wage or something like that. But uh, that's just how corporate America is. Um, so <clears throat> he, gave, he gave me a call this morning let me know uh, the job was secured. It's mine. And um, that uh, I just needed to go online and complete a couple of tasks um, on their website. Uh, I submitted a couple pieces of information, which I did. Give him a call back. He let me know he's going to give me one more call to just let me know exactly what day I can start come in, fill out my uh, paperwork, I and I and bullshit like that, and uh, and start my training. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very appreciative of the job. Uh, not trying to be condescending at all. Uh, it's going to give me what I need in order to uh, purchase the equipment to continue to build out my little independent media empire, what I'm trying to do. So, um, trying to build up this for myself because that's my passion and that's what I'm supposed to do in life. So that way I can give forward and, and give back to the community. Um, haven't really talked too much about this with you guys yet, but, um, so, <clears throat> uh, I feel like I've known, what I was supposed to do with my life um, for about 11 years now. I had an uh, epiphany. Um, yeah, about 11 years ago, 2005. Um, had a dream and woke up and had an epiphany um, knowing that I was supposed to somehow teach in this world or spread knowledge and <clears throat> give back by spreading knowledge and and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I looked and I went back to college um, sh shortly after that, just a few years after that and, um, thought for a while that I might want to teach in the public school system or, you know, maybe college classes or, uh, you know, teach in the more traditional sense as far as today's standards are concerned. Um, and then I realized that <coughs> shortly after I had that epiphany, I started to have other epiphanies about, you know, I, I realized the way the world was really being ran. And um, that a lot of things aren't the way that they seem to be at face value. And I realized that my teaching uh, was going to be much more unique. It wasn't going to be in a classroom setting. Um, I just didn't know exactly how I was going to do that. And see, and this is, and I had these epiphanies, but I was still like lost in a way. Like I didn't realize that it was going to like the platform or the vehicle for for myself to do these teachings or to, to do this was going to be what I had already had experience in and with, and that is, uh, right here, uh, on the airwaves with you guys. Um, not that I'm teaching you guys anything, but, uh, necessarily in, in this show, it's more, you know, maybe you're just learning something socially about me or, um, something about sociology, uh, witnessing me do this, but, um, it is, I was meant to teach using um, these platforms, um, both verbally um, and with video content, in order to uh, spread information in the world about how the financial systems ran, about how the birthing system is, about how our justice system is corrupt. Um, not just about forms of government either, just about the way we should be living our lives, um, leading our lives with our hearts and, and, um, not living them out of hate and stuff. And, and I'm such a hypocrite because I've spent so much of my time, even today I woke up in a bad mood, you know? So like I could just wake up in a bad mood and then I have to come full circle before I can even start attaining my goals for the day. So, um, you know, we're all susceptible to it, but, 
Um, <clears throat> I was meant to use my creative powers in order to draw people in with entertainment and then give them information, um, whatever it may be. So um, that's what that's why I'm here right now with you guys. That's my goal in life. That's why I'm trying to um, broaden the amount of content I'm offering, more shows, different variety of content, um, spreading knowledge about all sorts of different things in the world. And um, I'm just freestyling on top of my head right now, but that's what I was meant to do, and that's why I'm here right now. And so um, I understand that right now I'm just at the beginning of this thing, and I have to work hard for a long time in order to um, attract people around my soapbox so that they'll they'll start paying attention to what I have to say and so that I can start fulfilling my life goals at the fullest. And um, with any success that I gain from producing content for you guys, uh, with a lot of that, I want to give back to the people. you know. Um, so I want to spread information, and then on the back end, I want to help use a lot of what I earn um, towards giving back. I want to start a soup kitchen, um, maybe even a mobile soup kitchen, like a, a food truck that once or twice a week you doubles as a mobile soup kitchen and it just goes around handing out meals to families who need it um, or to people, individuals who need it, whoever needs it, you know, whoever's hungry, whether you're homeless or not or, you know, whether you got some bad situation going on in your life or not if you're hungry um and you'd like a meal i'd like to be able to afford that to you and and um I, that's just a, a simple way i feel like humans can show each other that they care is by you know sharing a meal together so i, I want to do that um i have this idea in my head um to open some sort of organization where um i help people either I help people for one just base just with basic survival needs so I can go around it so I would go around like a van in the morning and pick people up um, if they want to sh shower wash their clothes um, a free new set of clothes a free blanket some food um, you know there's you know I don't know if you guys have ever, ever taken a psychology class but there's this thing called Laszlo's hierarchy of needs and before we can extend ourselves and allow ourselves to blossom and truly carry out our life's purpose. We have to have our basic survival physical needs met. And uh, so a lot of these people, uh, they originally chose to be where they're at in life. But once they've chosen themselves to be there and started living in the reality of that role in their life, it's hard to even it's hard to meet to keep your basic needs met in life and so i i want to help people get those back because that's a lot of what people feel dehumanized about like uh, they go in their in their own head they're gonna get, they go how the fuck am i gonna apply for a job or have a job interview when i fucking can't even go in there with a clean pair of pants or a clean shirt i don't have anything to wear where do i get it i you know and it's like you go down a rabbit hole. It's just like a, a successful person goes down their rabbit hole of success and then, then they can't see on the flip side of that how to not be successful or how could people live their life in ways that are different from theirs. A uh, person who goes down the rabbit hole of non-success um, does the same thing and they don't know. They forget how to see the other side of the coin. So I want to be able to open up some sort of organization. My father's name... Um, was Rodney Hawker, and so I, I was thinking about naming it like, uh, you know, the Rodney Hawker organization for, you know, better health. I don't know something. That's just gen something generic just came off the top of my head. But I want to name it after him, and I want it to be some sort of um, organization that helps people attain their goals no matter what they are. So if you're if you just need your basic survival needs met, and that's all you want from me, that's fine. I'll help you do that. Um, because I know in my education and uh, in my experience in life that if I just help them meet those things, then they can maybe start thinking about some other things. You know, maybe it'll give them the 
what they need to, uh, you know, make a step forward in their life, whatever that is, you know? So, um, if people want, uh, also things I want to offer in this organization, it's like if people need, um, communication skills training, like just basic interview training or like, uh, how to speak, uh, professionally in public, uh, things like that. Just, uh, a lot of people don't know how to go into an establishment and present themselves as a, uh, a career seeker and how to land a job. And, uh, even though I don't think, even though like it's not my life's goal to work for somebody for the rest of my life at all, you guys know this already. If you've listened to any of these already, um, obviously people still got to fucking do it to survive. So, um, it's just a reality in this world. And if somebody out there feels like they would want to try to fucking get a job again, or just, you know, uh, try to do that in their life, then it's something that I've done a lot in my life very successfully. So I would help them do that as well. Um, that just only makes sense. So, uh, not only that, um, if they wanted to, um, uh, at this point, if I was able to open up that organization, I would be successful to the point where I would have my own successful business essentially. So, um, if they wanted to take part in helping out with video projects, like being a grip or, um, you know, a cameraman or somebody, you know, just performs, that's what a grip is, but performs just like small tasks on set and stuff like that. Um, you know, every day when I go round people up, I can, you know, uh, see if they want to work on a day to day basis, you know, something like that, you know, nothing, a lot of, the, a lot of people that need help, long-term commitment scares them. So just a day to day commitment might be something that a lot of them might use as training wheels to get back to the ability to making a long-term commitment in their life. So, um, stuff like that. So, um, that's why I'm here. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to entertain people and I want to share my stories with people because I feel like there's people who could be going through the same types of things that I'm going through in this life. Um, and that hearing it from somebody else and how they handled it or didn't handle it might help them handle it in the way they need to, in order to remove themselves from a negative situation or to get through an obstacle in their life. Uh, so that being said, um, I just, uh, signed up for a new podcasting platform this morning. Um, it's called the Satchel podcast player. Um, so, uh, they already gave me a shout out on Twitter. They, um, they shared my, uh, YouTube channel page, uh, my feed page through them, um, on Twitter. And so I appreciate, thank you guys from Satchel. I really appreciate that. Um, and so for all you guys out there who listen to iTunes, uh, maybe who don't know what the Satchel podcast player is, um, you know, the Satchel podcast player is definitely a great way, um, to get connected with the content you're listening to. Um, you could do things like tweet directly into the show. Um, once I get live, um, and a a really cool thing is that, uh, if you do feel like you want to support the cause that I'm trying to start up here, um, starting a successful media, uh, independent media outlet coupled with wanting to eventually be able to start up uh, community action type organizations to help communities uh, around um, us locally here. Uh, then you could even uh, in the Satchel podcast player, when you go to my uh, podcast, the morning recording, um, you'll see a prompt there, a call to action there um, to help support the show. You could donate like $1, $3, $10, bucks, uh, you know, however much you feel like, um, this project is worth, you know, if you don't feel like you're behind it at all, that's understandable. That's cool. Um, at a financial point, if you want, if you like, there's no, there's no pressure, you know what I'm saying? All that you could just listen to me and, uh, that's enough support for me. Listen to me on YouTube and, uh, you know, I don't need anything, uh, financially, but it does help. The reality of the situation is that it does help, uh, the quicker, um, that I could purchase, uh, equipment like a uh, high definition camera, um, a sound mixer, a new laptop, new software, um, all the cords and cables that I'll need. Uh, I need a boom mic with an arm. I need a couple of si- uh, scissor mics. Um, I want to get a USB to um, 
what's the name of the jack for the professional microphones? Uh, slipping my mind right now, but I need to get one of those converters. Um, yeah, I need to get all kinds of things. I need to get uh, more lighting right now. I do have. I need to purchase backgrounds right now. I have. Uh, I do have um, a lighting kit and a background kit um, for uh, set production. Um, about a ten foot wide set for, you know, um, interviews or um, introductions to shows, things like that, or just shows where um, it's just me speaking to my audience, um, introdu introducing something or exiting out of something. Um, I do have that already, so I just, uh, you know, I have the bare minimum of what I need for some production, but I'm really only <laughs> half of the way there, so I need to further out um, my toolbox here, so that way I can bring you guys uh, a more variety of content and higher quality content. Uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh Anyway, so anyway, you can donate on Satchel Player, $1, $3, $10, however much you feel like we're worth. And um, you can do that right within the Satchel Player, so that's pretty cool. Um, if you guys want to check it out, go to satchelplayer.com. That's S-A-T-C-H-E-L-P-L-A-Y-E-R.com. Um, yeah, and then that would be awesome. Um, so you guys go there, um, listen to the morning recording. Don't feel any pressure to donate anything, but if you feel like you would like to, bam, you could do it right in there. So, um, pretty neat. We're also on iTunes, uh, Critically Creative Entertainment on iTunes. The morning recording is listed there. Um, and we're, of course, on YouTube. That's If you're listening to this right now, most likely you are listening to it on YouTube. Um, we I, I do have podcasts on SoundCloud. I've reached my upload limit. I can't afford to upgrade my package there yet to the unlimited. So, um, no more podcasts there on SoundCloud until, uh, until I, you know, uh, get my first paycheck from the job I just got or until I earn some revenue from the content I'm producing. So, um, like I said, you are, you're, you're witnessing the reality of someone trying to set something like this up. Um, especially in, uh, today's times where it's tough to do something on your own so um i don't want to have to work for other companies i want to do this full time but i'm going to have to put in some time for some companies in order to uh, make that money that i need for the equipment um if you guys want you can help me out on satchelplayer.com and donate right there or just subscribe and watch my videos on youtube that helps me out as well um so there it is uh, so i already told you guys that i got the job that's really neat um a show that I'm going to start producing, um, and I'm just going to come honest, come uh, clean with you guys. Uh, the show then and now, um, I started just the very beginning of production um, on that, and then I, uh, for no reason, uh, I just I have it completed the first episode. So uh, I'm going to do that for you guys. I don't know why. Maybe. Uh, it's not my most passionate project. I'm not sure why I lost steam on that. Um, or, you know, I don't know. But I just wanted to come clean with you guys and let you guys know that I am going to finish that. I did mention that a few times last week. Because um, it, it is a cool little show. And I, and I do want to do it. So I um, just wanted to be honest with you guys and let you guys know that I have not completed that. But I did mention it just to keep myself honest there. Um, with that, I am going to... This makes me sound wish-washy, but... I, I am going to start a, uh, a different show as well. Um, it's for my CR2 sports channel. Um, it's going to be called All Decade Squads. And it's going to be a show where we list uh, the choices for the best player at each position for the decade in any given sport. So I'm going to start out with the NBA. Um, so we're going to do a starting five for each decade in the NBA. So I'm going to start out with the NBA All-90 squad. And in each show, uh, we're going to nominate three players for each position. And then ultimately choose one player for each position to fill out our um, our all decade starting squad, um, and we're gonna start out with the 1990s. So I've already created my nominees, so I'm just gonna share the nominees with you guys right now. I'm not gonna share the winners, um, who they're actually gonna be uh, for each position, but we're just gonna go over the nominees right now. Uh, so any sports fans out there, um, I hope you're here with me. And I hope you're enjoying this. So uh, so for our NBA All-90 squad, our point guard nominees, uh, Gary Payton, point guard for uh, <clears throat> the Seattle Supersonics um, for most of his career, ended up going to the Lakers late in his career. Uh, 
one of the most charismatic, uh, well-balanced point guards out there. Um, a guy that had to work hard on his uh, jump shot early in his career in order to uh, round out his game. Um, didn't have the highest assist numbers, but just an all-around great player offensively. Um, he knew when to be aggressive, and he, and he knew when to make the dish off. Like A lot of other aggressive point guards have a hard time with that balance. Gary Payton never had an issue with that. Uh, John Stockton, uh, the point guard for the Utah Jazz, the all-time assist leader. Um, just a bad motherfucker. Um, played in tandem with Carl Malone. Um, there in Utah, they got him to a couple of NBA finals where uh, they didn't ever quite get over that hump and win the championship. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, John Stockton, really great all-time point guard in the NBA. Uh, and then our third nominee, <clears throat> our third and final nominee for our point guards in the All-90 squad is Jason Kidd. Um, drafted in 1994, Jason Kidd made an Im immediate impact. Um, for the Dallas Mavericks and then being traded to the Phoenix Suns and then eventually playing for the Nets. And he had success wherever he went. <clears throat> and um, just a, one of the best all-time point guards. Uh, had an excellent three-point shot to go along with it. Um, and uh, could always make great alley-oop passes, great dishes. Um, had a little bit off-the-court drama, but this isn't about that. This is about their on-court performance. So um, Gary Payton, John Stockton, and Jason Kidd are three nominees for the uh, for point guard position in our NBA all 90 squad. Uh, shooting guard, uh, first nominee, just going to go ahead and get him out of the way. It's no surprise. Michael Jordan, um, probably the most dominating player ever in the NBA, just to be honest. I'm a lifetime Lakers fan, but uh, especially in the 90s and – even though he had a hiatus after his father died in the mid nineties, um, came back and, uh, showed that he was still dominant. And, um, it's hard to go away from something for a couple of years and then come back to it. And when that something is, uh, being the best player in the NBA and winning championships, even after you took the hiatus and, and, um, that time off that you needed to regroup from your father's death, um, you know, of course, Michael Jordan is one of the nominees here for shooting guard. Uh, Clyde the Glide Drexler, um, shooting guard for the Portland Trail Blazers, um, had just as much hops, if not more, than Michael Jordan. Uh, could uh, float like a butterfly, literally. That's what they call him, the Glide. Like he had a sick amount of hang time. Uh, so Clyde Drexler, uh, a point, uh, you know, a point threat from all over offensively. Um, <clears throat> could drive the ball like nobody else and uh, get to the rim like nobody else. So uh, Clyde Drexler, our second nominee at shooting guard. And then Reggie Miller. Um, until <clears throat> the most current generation or the last two generations of players existed, Reggie Miller um, was probably known, him and Larry Bird are probably known as the two best um, three-point shooters, uh, just purest shooters in the NBA. Now that we've experienced Ray Allen and Steph Curry for a while, um, Reggie Miller still top five in my book, uh, all-time three-point shooters. Um, also just had a knack for where his defender was around him, um, whether or not he think he could put the shot up, and then uh, throwing that leg and that knee out there to make contact with the defender to draw the foul uh, while taking the three-point shot. Uh, Reggie Miller one of the most deadly offensive players ever and uh, definitely deserving of a spot as a nominee uh, for shooting guard for the NBA all 90s squad from CR two sports, a uh, small forward um, first nominee, Scotty Pippen um, played second fiddle to Michael Jordan. Most of his uh, career, uh, not that that's anything to be ashamed of, um, on a lot of other teams in the NBA, without Michael Jordan, he would have been the best player on those teams. Uh, just a stud offensively, defensively, hustled hard. Um, it, it's Scottie Pippen is like having Rick Fox, but with offense. Um, Scottie Pippen <clears throat> played tough defense, uh, made um, all defensive squads in his uh, during his career multiple times, and also um, offensively, his ability to both distribute the ball. And uh, to take the ball to the rack, um, make him one of the best players in the 90s all, all around and definitely one of the best small forwards in the game uh, in the 90s. So uh, Scottie Pippen, our first nominee for small forward. Uh, second nominee, drafted the same year as Jason Kidd, Grant Hill, um, small forward for the Detroit Pistons. 
for a long time. Injuries, I believe, um, shortened his career definitely and made him less of a impactful player um, early on, earlier in his career than he would have liked definitely. But still, the years that Grant Hill was a superstar, Grant Hill was absolutely on fire. Um, led the Pistons to the playoffs multiple times. Um, one of the only players to rock a Fila shoe contract. <laughs> Uh, Grant Hill wa- was an awesome small forward and definitely deserving of being on this list. Our <clears throat> third small forward, someone who played uh, the wing, um, you know, could play small forward, shooting guard, or go up to power forward if he needed to. Uh, Dominique Wilkins, um, Atlanta Hawks, uh, up there um, as far as his, his uh, jumping ability uh, with Jordan, Drexler, Kobe Bryant. Um, the greats in the NBA. Dominique Wilkins was a sick slam dunk artist, um, and not just that; he was just a, a just an awesome, well rounded, all around player. Um, and uh, just wish he would have had a couple of more role players in order to uh, make them what they needed to be in order to maybe get a championship while he was there. Um, him and uh, who was it? Spud Webb. I believe was the point guard. Um, yeah, so uh, power forward. We're going to go with our first uh, nominee here is going to be Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman uh, perpetually sold as taller than what he really was. Uh, six seven, six eight at the most. He a lot of uh, <clears throat> actually like six 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 seven. He was oftentimes sold as like anywhere from uh, six eight to six ten in his career. Uh, maybe the best purest rebounder of all time. His positioning, his ability to box out, and his tenacity on the boards. Um, you can only average like 16 boards in the NBA per season if you're doing some things at an elite level. And he definitely did. Uh, interesting about Dennis Rodman is that in high school and in college, he was known as a scoring threat. He scored like 20-something, 30-something points a game um, before he got to the NBA. And in the NBA, his offensive skills just it wasn't where he focused. And the uh, it was obvious that in college and in, and in high school he didn't the average player didn't have the offensive prowess as what they did in the NBA. So his offensive skills weren't what it wasn't the pinnacle of his skill set and and uh, that's okay. He did what he needed to do perfectly, especially uh, you know not especially everywhere he went with the Pistons, with the Spurs, with the Bulls. Um, you know they the Bulls already had what they needed. As far as offensive went, offensive uh, firepower went, they didn't need Dennis Rodman to do that. They needed him to swipe those boards off the glass, both offensively and defensively, and uh, get that ball back into the hands of the playmakers on that team. And that's what he did. Our second nominee, uh, Charles Barkley. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. That's terrible. That's just terrible. Uh, Charles Barkley, probably top five, definitely, maybe top three all time power forwards in the game. Um, gets a bad rap now uh, <laughs> after his career for just, you know, a lot of people like to make fun of him the way he talks and uh, the way he does his job on uh, analyzing the NBA there. But uh, just a ferocious player. Uh, also someone who was sold as being taller than what he probably really was. And <clears throat> he uh, just offensively, defensively, he was a stud. Um in a world, you know, in a different world where there wasn't just a couple of other players, Charles Barkley could have been a seven-time champion himself, or maybe he was just on a different team somewhere other than the 76ers or the Suns. Um, he definitely could have won more championships uh, than what he did. Um, so, And then our third nominee is going to be Carl Malone, uh, the mailman, uh, the guy that the ref would let take eight steps into the lane and then dunk it on your face. Uh, <laughs> but the fans wanted to see it. So, uh, but Carl Malone, uh, the, uh, the man on the other end of John Stockton's assists, uh, just, uh, the top of the heap as far as power forward production goes, um, average, you know, 25 plus points a game many times in his career, um, lots of rebounds, um, just all over the place. And one of the most impactful players on the court. Um, took that team to the finals uh, multiple times. They couldn't quite get over the hump. But, uh, yeah, just a wonderful player. So our third nominee for power forward, 
uh, for the NBA All-90 squad, Carl Malone. So Dennis Rodman, Charles Barkley, and Carl Malone at power forward. And for center, um, our last position here, um, in the 90s, there was just a shit ton of selections for players who could be on this nomination list. Um, there were true big men back in the day um, that had dominating skill sets um, more often than there are today. There's just not that many out there today. Um, so our first nominee for center of our NBA all 90 squad uh, is Patrick Ewing. Uh, the man um, so uh, sought after that uh, there's a whole conspiracy theory created at, um, by the way he was drafted. Um, some people believe that Daniel Stern um, architected him being drafted to the New York Knicks. Uh, they wanted the Knicks, who are part of a massive market there in New York, uh, to be great once again. And so uh, it's said that possibly that the envelope that contained Patrick Ewing's name, or actually, I'm sorry, the New York Knicks name, yeah, because they're drafting the uh, the spots for the lottery. So the New York Knicks name uh, was ice cold, so that way Daniel Stern would know that that was uh, what, which envelope he needed to select there. So <laughs> Patrick Ewing, uh, we shouldn't let that dwarf his on-court uh, dominating performances. Uh, just never quite got all the way there, never quite won that championship, but uh, him, Charles Oakley, and John Starks did some serious work there in the 90s with the Knicks. And Patrick Ewing um, had that drop step. He had that fadeaway. Uh, he had the ability to uh, shoot a hook over you. He could drive it. Uh Tenacious rebounder, lots of effort. Uh, so Patrick Ewing, one of the best centers of all time. Could have won some championships maybe if he was just on a different squad or had a couple of different role players around him. Uh, our first nominee for center in our NBA All-90 squad. Our second nominee is going to be the Admiral David Robinson, uh, part of the Twin Towers there in the late 90s with him and Tim Duncan, um, early 2000s. Um, but before that, he was dominating all by himself. Um, had a an underpowered squad and still uh, made it to the playoffs and, and did fascinating things on the offensive side of the court and defensive side of the court. Uh, he was a well-balanced player. He could uh, swat your shot if you thought you were going to come into the lane and get one on him, and uh, he could dunk it over you or take a shot over you on the offensive side if he needed to. So the Admiral, just an amazing player to watch. Like My words don't do any of these players justice that are on this list anyways, so... Uh, these are just 15 of the baddest ass NBA players of all time. And um, I'm not saying anything new or reinventing the wheel in regards to speaking about these players, but David Robinson, the Admiral, an awesome player, definitely in my book, um, one of the top centers of all time. And definitely uh, one of the three nominees for the NBA all 90s squad from CR two sports. Uh, our third nominee, uh, the dream. You guys know, he would, you guys know this list, um, wouldn't be here without him on it. I mean, Hakeem, the dream, Elijah Wan, the most comprehensive set of inside post moves to ever exist uh, in the NBA. I don't know how an NBA today exists um, where there's not more players who adapted the dreams post moves. I mean, it just baffles me. He, he is well known for teaching the best big men in the game today, his post moves. Um, but, it's just like you would think that with the level of ability and skill and talent that big men had in the 90s that the kids that were growing up watching that would have – you just think there would be more pure big men in the game today. Um, there's just not. But it's just amazing to me um, that the evolution of the center position, um, this was its pinnacle. If anything, it's regressed from, from how it was in the 90s to, de to today. These players – um, we're the shit, are the shit, and will always be the shit. And Hakeem the Dream is probably the number one skilled offensive center to ever play the game. And yes, we're still talking about player. We're talking about players included in that, like uh, Lou Alcindor, uh, better known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Wilt Chamberlain. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, and Bill Russell. So Bill Russell was a defensive mastermind, but um, so Hakeem. Uh, you know, if I had to choose a center all time, like, uh, it might be a young Shaquille O'Neal or it might be Hakeem Olajuwon. And, um, Shaquille is an honorable mention 
on this list. Um, the reason, don't worry, we're going to take care of Shaq. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be on one of these lists, but it's not going to be this one. Um, he won his championships in the 2000s, so um, did his biggest work so with the Lakers. So, um, Anyways, in case you guys were wondering where he was at on this list, but it's just like another example of how many ridiculously gifted big men there were back in the day. It's fucking crazy that there aren't more uh, big men out there today. Like Dwight Howard. Um, I don't think he's the best center in the NBA if he plays during the mid to late 90s or anywhere in the 90s. So um, he's somewhere probably in the top 10 of centers. He's still a valuable center any any generation to play. But, uh, you know, these dominating centers. And then another honorable mention for center, Dikembe Mutombo. Um didn't quite make it on the list because uh, just purely defensive in an era where a lot of centers had great defense and great offense. So anyways, um, that's my nominees for the NBA all 90 squad. You guys will have to watch the first episode of all decade squads to find out who wins uh, the position uh, and the honor for being the CR two sports um, starters for the all 90 squad. So that's that. Um, <clears throat> yesterday I gave a shout out to my to my family, to all my family everywhere, up here, down there, around there, across the train tracks, the bad side of town, uh the assholes in Mariposa. Um <laughs> but I forgot to mention a couple of names. Um Brian and JT. Um those are uh two brother in laws. Uh Brian is Kaylee's husband and JT is Candy's husband, and they've been around in my life for a long time. Um, JT used to play basketball with me and my younger brothers out in the driveway, and used to let us rough him up a little bit. And he he'd get he would get us back though, uh, especially Cody. Cody thought he could fucking just brutalize JT out there, and JT wouldn't do nothing because Cody was a foster kid, and JT is an adult, and he's like new in the family and shit like that. JT fucking we used to have a boat <clears throat> right next to the driveway we used to, the driveway on one side was on the right side was the lawn on the left side hand side was uh like gravel and river rock and shit like that and our dad had even though by the time I was around there he never took it out anymore and it was an older boat it was like an old speed boat and uh I don't remember what Cody did he like JT was trying to go for a layup and Cody like tripped him and he like fell and like hit his face or some shit like that. And he got up and boy, cause we had told JT, like you might want to start. Cause even though I fucking fucked with JT sometimes too, like Cody would fuck with him real bad. And, uh, <laughs> JT, uh, grabbed him by like the scuff of his collar and planted his ass against that boat and held him there and said, you better stop fucking, doing this shit to me in fucking until Cody was crying basically. And I'll tell you, Cody, uh, tough little son of a bitch, but he deserved that one. Uh, and I gave JT, well, one time when JT was going for a layup, I put my elbow into him and, uh, pushed him. And we, we both went into the, uh, the garage door and there's, unless the new owners of that house or unless they back in the day, I don't remember if they ever took that dent out, but there was forever a dent in where we hit the, the garage door when, uh, I played some really over the line tough defense on JT there, um, and I probably deserved to get my ass kicked too. Um, I want to say he took another hard fall too. Uh, we were playing football. We used to play football on the street, out on the asphalt, and the whole family would get out there. Sometimes, like every once in a while, like most of the days, like we, like me and Casey and Cody and and Dad, we'd all go out there and play. But on some time, some days uh, during the weekends, like maybe we were having like a family get together, a barbecue, like the whole family would get out there, like fucking twenty plus people would get out there and play football. And uh, I think it was JT got he was going for a. They were his team was on offense, and my dad was a quarterback and threw him a pass, and he caught it and like got tripped up or something, and like just like fell flat on his face. And uh, man, he used to take some rough some rough and tumble shots out there. So, uh, and Brian used to get out there and play with us every once in a while too. Brian didn't really like playing sports that much. He's like mechanic kind of, uh, likes to hang out with guys and talk about the new fucking, the newest. I don't fucking know. I know nothing about mechanics. I was raised around mechanics. I know nothing about fucking mechanics, but he likes to talk about the newest car parts and performance 
parts and shit for cars and shit he's building. And uh, that's the type of guy. And that's cool. And that's awesome. And uh, he's a great man. And he's a great father. And, uh, you know, just he never really found his niche when we got there and play sports stuff. That's what I love to do was to go out there and, like, play games and play sports and roughhouse. And he liked roughhouse, too. He's a tough little son of a bitch. Don't get me wrong. But he, uh, you know, just liked, uh, you know, he took auto shop, like, he used to have auto shop for like four of the seven periods out of the day when he was a senior in high school. I think I remember something like that. Like he was in auto shop all four years of high school. And it was his thing. And that's his career. And, and that's, it, what the cool thing was is that he married a girl whose father was a lifelong mechanic, my dad. Um, and see, I'm just going to go ahead and get this on the clear right now. So <clears throat> you guys probably been listening to me. Um, I don't like to make differentiate. Like I don't like to differentiate like – calling someone my foster dad versus my dad or my foster mom versus my mom, because I do obviously have biological parents out there. Um, but like, and I call my dad, dad, like my real dad, dad and my biological mother, Michelle. Um, that's like, it's a more complicated story. Um, but she's still my mom. And, but when I, for the most part, unless I say anything different, when I say mom and dad during these stories, I'm talking about, um, Scott and Debbie, um, the mom and dad who put in real work towards me and helped me get on track and like not get on track, but figure out who I am in the world. And I wouldn't have graduated high school and, um, learned how to, uh, survive in the world, um, all the way if it weren't for them. So, um, I'm calling them mom and dad. Um, that's what they deserve. So, um, anyways, Oh shit. Now I fucking forgot where I was at in the story. Uh, we would all get out there and play football and, uh, JT would get fucked up. Oh, and, oh, okay. No, I, I remember now. Okay. All right. And so Brian was real lucky in the fact that he married a girl and got with the girl whose father, uh, my dad was a mechanic his whole life. So he's a computer tech, uh, for a long time. He worked on the, um, he could do all the mechanical processes as well, but, um, for the most part, uh, from the time I've known him in my life, he's a computer technician in cars and he can, he can take apart and, and build a, 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 a household PC or a laptop or any computer you put in front of him. Like he can figure it out. He's very intelligent, uh, as far as, uh, his, you know, ability to work with mechanics or, or with computer technology. And I'm good with, uh, some stuff like I'm good with like um, electronics and with wiring stereos and, and shit like that. But he can do that and he can do that and everything. He could he can uh, work at any as with any aspect of any electronic or, or, com- or computer part. So um, Brian was lucky to have him and still is lucky to have him as a father in law um, out of high school. Brian uh, took all his mechanic classes was that's what he wanted to do with his life. And he was able to get a job in that field, you know, in a shop right away. Um with my dad. So, um, you know, Brian and JT both deserve a shout out in the morning recording, even though nobody's listening to it. Maybe you guys will someday, (laughs) but I just wanted to give them a shout out because I didn't give them that yesterday. Uh, so talked about a lot today already. Um, been about 45 minutes. I think it's about time to let you heathens go. Um, still haven't got my call back from, the manager of that place, um, he'll call me sometime. I already got the job, so uh, even though I've done this before and getting getting a job still, like I know it's not what I really want in my life, but just knowing that I can still do that, I guess, kind of feels good um, for some reason. Even though I know that's not what I want to do, it still feels good. But um, wait for his call. I'll let you guys know uh, when I start tomorrow. Uh, may affect my ability to release this podcast every day but um it shouldn't i might have to record in the afternoon sometimes it's still i'll still call it the morning recording it don't i don't get it out to you guys i can't record live right now anyways i don't have everything i need to record live so this is brought to you um post dated anyways so you know you guys will get it when you get it all right (laughs) that's life you get it when you get it nobody else can get it for you you got to get it yourself so that comes down with everything so i hope you guys have a wonderful day Um, It's been nice hanging out with you. This has been the morning recording.